Hertel Show, welcome back. We're thrilled to have M. Carpenter, one of our regular with us. Usually have her on for legal news and things like that, speaking lawyery things and big words that we don't understand, and she has to explain to us. We're going to have a little bit more fun because her other passion is true crime stuff. And M, we are seem to really be in a renaissance period with true crime stuff, don't we? Yes. Yep. It's great to be a, a true, cr- true crime fan these days some of the ones that really jump out at you because obviously there's all kinds of documentaries on the streaming services everybody has their favorite podcast things like this but you you are also an attorney uh, you've been a prosecutor you've actually investigated crimes you know more about this than the average viewer does which ones really jump out at you as as quality true crime programs i I prefer podcasts mostly these days. It fits in better with my time because I can listen while I'm cleaning or cooking. And um, there are a few good ones. Depends on your your uh, your your view of things. A lot of people don't want to have comedy <laughs> mixed in with their true crime. They find it disrespectful, and that's understandable. But there are a few that are sort of funny podcasts that I enjoy. Um, my favorite murder is one of them. Another that I enjoy is uh, called Sinisterhood. Uh, one of the hosts of Sinisterhood is is also an attorney, and she's also a stand up comedian. Her and her co host. So there's some some comedy in there, but uh, she's also knowledgeable and she does a good job of explaining quirks in the law that a lot of podcasts don't have the knowledge to uh, to explain. So they just kind of skirt around them or say, "What's up with that?" or "Why is that?" Why are they doing that where she can can explain that? Um, but there's a little humor in there. And, and I like that. Another one, one of the first podcasts of, crime, of true crime that I listen to is called Generation Y, W-H-Y. And it's not so much funny as serious, but they're very respectful. Um, and uh, they do a good job of finding the, the real facts of the case and not just the media speculation. They do their own research. So I prefer those. Um, on TV, you know, Forensic Files is, is a longtime favorite of mine. Uh, it seems to always be on. And I always joke when I go travel somewhere, if I'm alone in a hotel room, I can turn my TV on at any time and, and find Forensic Files. And so uh, that's one of my, my favorite go-tos. And there's some good sort of one-off mini series that come up on Netflix that are worth watching. And it really runs the gamut from complete exploitive, exploitive crap to good quality um, shows. So I'll watch any of it really. <laughs> well, with that high standard in mind, um, <laughs> but what is it about true crime? Cause we've always had a fascination with it uh, as, just as human beings. Of course, with technology now, we can all kind of get a la carte, whatever we want. What is it about true crime that always fascinates people so much? What is it that um, do you think? Obviously, you're a big fan of the genre, but when you try to discuss this with other people that maybe aren't a fan of it, what, what do you think it is about the human experience that they just get sucked into these true crime stories? I think it fascinates a lot of people to realize just how terrible one person can be to another. It, it, it's outside of most of our experience to, to imagine uh, the terrible things that happen to people. And so I think it's just sort of the curiosity of people who are among us, but so unlike us. Um, my true crime interest goes back to my childhood. And I, re- I remember hearing about Ted Bundy, um, and this was when I was maybe five or six years old, because, you know, that was the early 80s, right? So, but I remember hearing about it. I don't know if my mom was talking about it, or if I had read about it, because I did read newspapers and things, even at that age, because I was a weird child. Uh, But I recall, it's very cringy to think about now, but I remember my first grade teacher asking all of us in the class if we would you know, what we would do to make the world a better place what change would we make in the world and when it was my turn I said um, executing Ted Bundy 
which is probably an odd thing for my teacher to hear out of her first grader. So my fascination goes way back. Um, and so I don't really know what started it other than just maybe the same thing where people enjoy scary movies, something that scares them, it's just that these are real life monsters and real life bad guys. Yeah, talking to M. Carpenter, who is a real life attorney, but likes to uh, stay at a Holiday Inn last night and solve crimes through her TV, like just about everybody else these days. Um, we've talked about, and it's been kind of a thing for the last, oh, I guess, 15 years or so, but uh, attorneys and legal experts have talked about talked about the CSI effect, how that is affected when they go to right. pool ju juries and things like this, that um, sometimes these shows can have a, a negative effect because they think, well, everything can be solved by DNA or you always have a, you know, a clear cut motive, these sorts of things. Do you think this is a positive or a negative, this current wave of true crime? Do you think it's improving uh, overall knowledge of the criminal justice process or do you think it's hurting? I think it's improving in some ways. I do. I think that people are becoming more educated. Now, as an attorney, depending on which side of the courtroom you're on and the strength of your case, an educated jury is a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, if you have a, a, a weak case as a prosecutor, a smart jury is not a good thing for you. Um, but the CSI effect, that, that's definitely real. You know, you, people are waiting for that bombshell DNA testimony, the expert to come on and, and testify that the defendant's DNA was at the scene. And that happens quite a bit, uh, but it doesn't happen in every case. So it can be definitely be a harmful. It's, you have, the jury has to understand that lack of DNA evidence does not mean this person uh, is not guilty. Likewise, the presence of their DNA, depending on circumstances, doesn't necessarily mean anything. You know, um, my DNA would be expected to be in my husband's car. So if he would turn up dead <laughs> and, and they search the car, yeah, sure, they're going to find my DNA. That doesn't doesn't prove anything. So it's all in, in perspective, you know, every situation. It's up to the attorneys to do the a good job of, of explaining that and arguing that to a jury. Yeah, talking to him, Carpenter. Uh, let's take something that you know uh, really well. Some of these cases go viral. Um, we've talked about uh, the cases that have shown up on viral podcasts or on viral shows, and then they, they debate, you know, innocence or guilt or these things. And then there's ones like you've tried to cover, like the Clarksburg VA serial killer uh, that doesn't seem to get any traction at all, even though it seems to be an amazing story. Talk about it from your end as a content creator, because you're also a writer. You're not just an attorney. You're a senior editor at Ordinary Times. You do great writing every week. Talk about it from that end of when you get a true crime story that needs to be told like this VA one, and it just doesn't seem to get the traction you think it should. Talk about it from that angle. Sure. I think there's uh, a, a lot of it has to do with victimology, which is a real word used by criminologists. The type of victim has a lot to do with how much coverage case gets. Unfortunately, we saw that, you know, over the summer with with Gabby Petito, um, which was contrasted beautifully on your show with Molly McCluskey talking about the indigenous women and indigenous people that have gone missing that and have not been covered by our media. So, um, and in the, the VA case, you know, it was elderly men, um, you know, they were some of them nearing, probably nearing the end of their lives. And so there's sort of a, I don't want to say meh, but it's kind of what some people maybe don't have interest in that because it's sort of, um, you know, it's not a, a young, attractive person with their entire life ahead of them, that, you know, something you don't expect to have, a life you don't expect to end so soon. So it could be part of it. Um, and then, of course, being an angel of death is the type of killer. That's a complete own uh, category in and of itself that is not necessarily as interesting to some people because it lacks the blood and gore. Uh, I find it very interesting, the contrast between a caregiver and um, the exact opposite of that, becoming a murderer. So it, I think that the victim has a lot to do with it. Sometimes the perpetrator, you know, there's a lot of fascination with the typical serial killer, the, you know, out on the street, um, stranger danger type of serial killer that is actually pretty rare despite all of the publicity that they get 
those are um, obviously they get a lot of attention. They, I think they speak to a lot of fear that uh, especially young women have. And you know, women are, I, I believe, and I'm correct in saying the majority of true crime fans by a lot. Um, and so, yeah, it, it, I think it, it just depends. It's, it's the things that capture our imagination because they, we can relate to them. Um, and maybe a lot of us can't relate to 80 year old men in a veterans hospital, or we don't relate to or know much about indigenous people. We do know, you know, uh, the people who look like us or the people we see every day around us in our neighborhoods and our towns. And so when something happens to, to someone that we relate to, I think we pay more attention. Yeah. Talking to him, Carpenter, about some true crime. We're going to get into some of those things with her as we continue on her tell right after this. back with M. Carpenter, our legal eagle. She's usually here to talk about uh, the Supreme Court or a past law or something like that. But today we're talking about her personal passion for true crime and uh, the gory details, as it were. Uh, Why is it you mentioned that women are predominantly kind of the demographic for a lot of this? Why is it? It's not just um, uh, the stories, obviously. Uh, it's not just, you know, a demographic when they develop the TV series for these things. What do you think it is? Uh, you is one, I isn't, obviously. What is it about women and the true crime genre, do you think? I think a lot of it has to do with uh, being protective of oneself. I think, I, I think there's a feeling that if we know more about it, if we know what's out there, we can protect ourselves from it. And I think that might be part of it um, for me anyway, I guess I can only speak for myself, but I always feel empowered by knowledge. The more I know, uh, the better I feel, the safer I feel. It may be a false sense of security, but to me, knowing about these things, knowing they're out there, being aware of them, makes me feel like I can do more to keep myself safe. And I can't speak for everyone, but that's part of it for me. And part of it is just morbid fascination, uh, as I spoke about before, just knowing what can actually happen, you know, um, the fascination of what a person is able and capable of doing to someone else that I know that I could never fathom doing. Just um, it's a it's probably a combination of those things. But I, I think that, you know, women just want to know. Um, well, what situations can I avoid or what can I do to, to not fall prey? And there's a danger in that because I think, uh, you know, serial killers, for example, there's a lot of serial killers who have preyed on sex workers. And so, you know, women might think, well, I'm not a homeless drug addicted sex worker, so I'm not in danger. Um, so I think that's part of it is trying to separate ourselves from the type of person who falls victim to these things. Um, again, that would be a false sense of security. Obviously it can happen to anyone. So uh, but that's my, my theory on, on why women in particular are drawn to it. What about the ongoing <laughs> online theory slash joke that all uh, true crime watching by women, especially women that are in a relationship is really just planning ahead and research. <laughs> no comment. I'm sure your husband will be thrilled to know that. Uh, M. Carpenter joining us. You're somewhat outside of the system, even though you're an attorney, you've been a prosecutor, you've done these kind of cases, but you've also been a writer, you're a content creator now, you do shows like mine. What would you tell somebody that has one of these true crime stories, or they know of some kind of a true crime stories, and they want to try to get it some traction? And you know firsthand, because you've had to both defend and prosecute these cases where the system sometimes don't listen to folks. How would you tell them to use this new technology and use the ability of these hosts and all these online sleuths and these sorts of things to try to get their story out? Well, I would say just that, just to get your story out however you can. Put it on your own blog. Uh, submit it to other blogs. Submit it to Ordinary-Times. Um, we, you know, we can get it out there. 
uh, social media is a big way. There are a lot of podcasters who ask for recommendations of stories they should cover. And they sometimes, uh, some specifically will look for lesser known stories. There's a really good podcast called The Fall Line. And it focuses on little known cases in the southern, southeastern United States, some in your area there, North Carolina, they've done series on. Um, so, you know, you can tweet at your favorite podcasters or go to their web pages. They may have a submission button. You can put it in there. Um, and especially if you've already written it up, if you've already created an article or something that the podcaster can look at and get the details of. And, and if you're comfortable doing so, volunteer to be their guest to talk about the case, depending on your level of knowledge. So there are several ways. And I think just, you know, using social media to your advantage and being persistent is the best way to go. All right. I'm, I'm going to give you the time to do this because I know you've just been chomping at the bit to do it. But you you have to explain to us, because some of us don't understand it, what in the world a murder Reno is. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's the, the first podcast I mentioned, which is called My Favorite Murder. Um, probably it was my favorite for a long time. I um, even went to watch it live. But the fans of the murder of uh, My Favorite Murder podcast are called the Murderinos. Um, and then we all have, there are several, probably hundreds of Facebook groups of murderinos of various stripes. There's um, the the per Dorinos. There's our cat owners. Uh, there's mountain murderinos, West Virginia based. Um, my favorite murder fans. I'm in that group as well. And my personal favorite is the lawyerinos, of which I am a member in good standing as the the legal minded or legal profession fans of the show. Um, that that's my my main group so we're just a community of true true crime fans who happen to enjoy that one particular podcast uh if you were talking to somebody who was trying just as a way to kind of wrap up our time with M. carpenter today uh what's kind of the entry drug into true crime i know people like the detective shows on tv you mentioned forensic files which is kind of a long-standing one uh what, what would you say the good gateway drug for folks looking to get into the genre is well, I think that um, those the true crime documentaries like Forensic Files and, and Cold Case, things like that, uh, if you can get it, the old City Confidential, those were really good. Those are, they're not all, you know, necessarily serial killers. There's a lot of just small town crime that is an interesting story that you can get into. So I would start there. And then, you know, if you have a long drive or a boring cleaning or cooking chore coming up, you know, pop one on your podcast. There's a million of them. Just pick one and, and go with it. I think that you can't go wrong. Throw a rock. <laughs> and that's Tim Carpenter with us today on Herd Tell, ma'am. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. Thank you.